All right, take your Bible, if you will. We're going to continue about the fear of the Lord, and hopefully uh, you're getting something out of this. It might help you to, uh, to get in the right perspective of things. Appreciate, again, your kindness and your thoughtfulness, and uh, these things are not going to move along uh, quickly. We'll wait and see how things go. We're in the Lord's hands, and uh, we're not going to make it a point every time we get up to talk about what's going on, but it's uh, kind of like hitting a moving target right now, and uh, we'll... We'll see how things progress along. All right, Psalms chapter 19, if you want to uh, stand up. I wouldn't want to be going through what little bit we're going through and be any other place than where I'm at <laughs> with my family. And uh, you continue to pray for situation with my mom. I haven't mentioned a lot about that, but she's still not doing well. Um, but some things have kind of overridden that for us, but my sister and my brother and extended part of the family is having to do a lot of things to try to help to take care of her. And uh, we don't know yet where all of that's headed. So if you could keep that in uh, mind, we sure would appreciate it very much. Um, and uh, just pray for wisdom. If you could, please. But thank you for coming back tonight. I like seeing it full up on Sunday night. Amen. Now, if everything goes right and it sounds like the choir's already practiced over there next Sunday morning, uh, you'll have your uh, meeting over there. And I know some of you were there for, with us during the Jubilee, but you got carpet on the floor now and you got uh, things all fixed up. And they've got the sound system up and running and working the right way and the lighting is up and all that. And I uh, hope you'll come and be with us and bring somebody with you. I'd like to pack it out and make them come back and get, grab more chairs and uh, say, we need some more chairs, preacher, and that kind of thing. So if you could, you, you plan on coming, we'll have us a real hoot nanny. Now, uh, how many of you, this is rhetorical, it's not intended to get a, a, an answer from you, but how many of you, since you've been saved, you struggle with sin? <laughs> One or two? <laughs> okay. I appreciate your honesty and being candid. It's kind of like, well, yeah, I got a little problem with that, you know, every now and then. Um, I mean, if you look at sin the way the Lord looks at sin, then how we kind of clean it up a little bit. It's like, well, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not like other people, but I mean, I might have a little problem. Well, part of the problem with that comes from not fearing the Lord. And uh, that wisdom that you get that allows you to do things that you shouldn't do, if you learn to get the proper fear of the Lord, it'll help you to keep you clean. You say, why? Psalms 19, look if you will please in verse number 9. We're continuing to talk about the definition of what the fear of the Lord is. Psalm 19, verse number 9, the fear of the Lord is what? Clean. clean. Enduring forever, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Right? Brother Ross, you pray. Ask the Lord to help us, would you please? Thank you. You can have a seat. Look, if you will, with me to James chapter number three. And let's talk about the source for just a minute. Uh, it's important to have the right source. Uh, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is clean. And so if I fear the Lord, it'll keep me from dirty things. Yes, now, you live in a day and age where filthiness is around you and it's easy to get a hold of. The wrong mindset, the wrong attitude, the wrong idea. Your attitude is as important, if not more so, than your actions. Your attitude is more so important than your actions. How you approach something, the attitude that you have toward approaching those things is as important as the action you take when you're dealing with something. And so the source that you get your information from becomes imperative. If you get it from modern mainstream media, if you get it from modern mainstream uh, psychiatrists and psychologists, it's going to tend to run contrary to the Bible. Even Christian psychiatrists nowadays have a propensity to move toward mainstream theology instead of biblical theology. Now, this requires you to have faith on your part. It requires you to have faith in what the Bible says and faith in the Lord that saved you to do what he said, even though maybe everybody else is saying, well, that's not how we do it nowadays. Yeah, but what does the Bible say? The source that you have has a way that you can back check that. Look, if you will, James chapter 3, verse number 14. But if you had bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. So there's a problem right off the bat. Why? Because the conversation that's there that you're having is creating bitter enviness and strife. 
Where does that come from? Verse 15, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Now we've been over that before. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Would you agree that it's because the source is wrong? In other words, what comes out of the mouth and what comes out of the brain and what comes out of your actions is coming from a result of having put in the wrong material. They want to blame computers all the time for different things. Well, I don't know how it is now, and I don't keep up with all the stuff the way everybody else does. But let it suffice to say, somebody somewhere had to program the computer. It isn't always the computer's fault. A lot of times it has to do with whoever programmed the information that was in there that made the computer react. Now they may have all that stuff worked out nowadays and you got some artificial intelligence that's programming the computer and can tell you what you want. But back in the day, the source that the computer got the information from came from a person that programmed the material in there and caused the output to be a direct uh, reflection of what was put in. Well, in the Bible, the Bible teaches you clearly that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if I have the wrong source, then guess what's going to happen? I'm going to have the wrong attitude about certain things. If the fear of the Lord is clean, then that means if my mouth is dirty, then there's a problem. And the problem is, is the source is wrong. Now you can make whatever excuse you want to make for having a filthy mouth or having a filthy mind and having a dirty heart. But the bottom line is, you're picking up that from a source other than this source. If this source is pure and clean and you're putting it in, but you're effectually allowing it to work in you, it'll change how you talk. It'll change your perspective. It'll change how you treat individuals. You say, why? But if it's envy, strife, earthly, sensual, devilish, every evil work, you know what he says? Your source is wrong. It descends not from above, but it's earthly, sensual, devilish. It appeals to the world, it appeals to your senses, and it comes from the devil himself. Now look on down a little further in verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first what? Pure. Wouldn't he say the fear of the Lord's clean? Yes, sir. Okay, well you can't get more clean than pure. Amen. So he says it's first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. That's a pretty good source. Amen. I don't know who wouldn't wind up embracing that. Amen. Certainly somebody would be interested in getting a hold of that. Uh, take your Bible, if you will, please, and let's go a little bit further here. Uh, look, if you will, in Nehemiah chapter number 5. Nehemiah chapter number 5. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter number 5. And by the way, if you were caught off guard by that, I still sing the song sometimes. Sometimes I get up and I've read my Bible and I get to thinking to myself, where is that book in the Bible somewhere? And I'm thinking, and then I have to start singing the song. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You say, what? That's just how I can remember it sometimes. Now, maybe you probably just get there right there to and thumb it. I still have a Bible somebody gave me that has the little tabs on it. I'll probably have to use that as I get older because when you get older, your mind starts slipping on you a little bit and you're not able to get to the books. I'm supposed to be a preacher and I'm kind of like, can you tell me what page that's on? I can't find it in my Bible, right? You say, well, preacher, it, it shouldn't be that way. Well, you know what can happen to you as you get older, things don't quite come up to the surface as quick as they used to. <laughs> Look in Nehemiah chapter number five. Now, uh, we're talking about being clean. We're talking about uh, having a struggle with sin. Uh, 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 Paul says in the book of Hebrews, he said, run the race with patience, uh, laying aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. That's the Apostle Paul. That's Romans 7. Paul saying, the things that I should do, I don't. And the things I shouldn't, I do. So Paul's saying even 25 years after salvation, he's still struggling to do what's right to do. Galatians chapter number 5, he says, if you walk in the Spirit, he tells you that you're schizophrenic. He says, if you walk in the Spirit, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he tells you what the works of the flesh are. And you get to read the works of the flesh. Everything is in there that you can possibly imagine that you could do before you got saved. It's right there if you choose to walk in the flesh. It's as close as you're seeing yourself in the mirror right there. And he says, those are the capacity that you still can do that thing. Have you ever wondered sometimes, have you ever really taken serious uh, consideration of yourself and wonder, if I'm saved, how could I think that? Right. Yeah. 
If I'm saved, how could I be so upset about that? If I'm saved, how could I treat somebody like that? If I'm saved, why not I desire more of the things of the spirit than I do the things of the flesh? Do you ever get on a good, you know, kind of get on a beat yourself up day every, every now and then? And think, man, what a rotten Christian. What a sorry example I am of a Christian human being. You ever do that every now and then? It's good to look at yourself that way. If you walk in the flesh, that's what you are. You're nothing but a flesh pot walking around doing whatever you want to do and taking your salvation for granted. It didn't say you were lost. You're just walking according to the flesh. So if you have a struggle with sin, that, uh, the, the root of that is you've lost your fear of God. Suppose God chooses not to walk with you that particular day and you wind up getting yourself in a jam. And the Lord just decides not to protect you where He normally would. And the next thing you know, do you ever pause to think why you're able to sit here tonight? Did you ever think why you're not crippled up in a wheelchair somewhere? Do you ever wonder about that? Do you ever think why, why, how many times God protected you? Do you ever wonder why you're not laying in a hospital bed or sitting in a jail cell? Do you, ever, do you ever think about that kind of stuff? Do you ever wonder, some of you that saw action when you were maybe in Vietnam or a little bit after that, have you ever wondered, some of you policemen and things in here, have you ever wondered how you made it to the end of a shift? Uh, there's stuff that went on behind the scenes you didn't even know was going on. And the Lord protected you from that. All he had to do one day is just say, you know what, you're on your own. Have a good time. See you later. <laughs> I'll meet you on the way up. It's happened to plenty of people that I've known. I've known people that have walked out somewhere, jump on a motorcycle and take off, and then they spend the rest of their time in a nursing home uh, that are messed up and their heads swole up like a basketball. Why, why doesn't that, that, that happen? Well, all God has to do is just pull his hand back. Yes. You say, why? If God, that, that should scare you. It should bother you to sin. If the fear of the Lord is clean, then that means I should be, it should bother me to do something that's dirty. Does it bother you like it used to? It's gotten commonplace now. The reason I use the mouth is, is it's, like, uh, it's like the gift of tongues. When people talk about the gift of tongues, that's the easiest things of all the gifts of the Spirit to counterfeit. Ostil, Shantai, Antai, Bowtie, Economy, Honda. You know, you sound like you're speaking in tongues. You don't know what anybody said. So it's easy to do that. Well, you know what the Bible tells you in James chapter number 3? That you can control a big old multi-thousand pound uh, ship with a rudder and you can take a bridle and control a... a uh, 4,000 pound horse, but when it comes to your tongue, that thing's set on the fires of hell and you can't control it. So you know what I can tell? I can tell there's enough stuff in the Bible that tells me I can tell a lot about what the inward man is going through if I just listen to myself talk. And it bothers me. And so now the next thing you know, I get accustomed to not just saying things that are, that are wrong, that are filthy, that are rude, that are inconsiderate, but I get accustomed to hearing those things. And then the next thing you know, you don't think anything of it anymore when you hear all those foul words. I'm not going to mention them for you, but you know the foul words. It's, a, it's customary now. Right. I mean, you got curse-free TV, that thing bleeps out half of the whole thing. You can't even figure out what's going on. It's like watching a silent movie because it's constantly filled with... And people just... They just talk, you, you got people then... You know what they used to? I don't know. I haven't been in court in years. But if you used foul language unless you were repeating what a suspect said, they would admonish you in open court. If you used a curse word while you were testifying, that was taught me in courtroom demeanor and testifying. That was a no-no. But nowadays, I don't know, maybe it's just common because I hear people now, they stand in the grocery store line, they stand at Walmart, and they just say stuff and just, just, just filth comes out of their mouth. But you know what I've noticed? I've seen elderly ladies and just stand around like, you know, I've seen some of them stand around and say the same stuff that the younger ones are saying. And I'm thinking, boy, what a testimony, Grandma. What a, what a testimony to hear a woman talk that way. You expect a filthy old dog of a man to talk, but a... But a woman, I mean, goodness, you talk about tearing at the fabric of society. Uh, I'm talking about you. Have your ears got accustomed to hearing it? You say, well, no. Well, you know what you may not know? You may not know just the stuff your kids are saying around the church. I mean, you may think they're not saying it. I'm talking about at church. You say, where would they pick that up? I don't know. Where would they pick that up? I know this, I know if the fear of the Lord is clean, it'll, do, it'll go a long way in helping me live a clean life. I want to live a clean life. I want to do what's right to do. You say, why? I'm afraid of him, but I'm also afraid of, di of, of displeasing him. I don't want him to look down at me and say, yeah, that's my spoiled, stinking brat. 
every time I turn around, I got to tune him up because he just, just full of himself. I don't want to be that. Now, maybe you do, and that's fine. It's a free country to do whatever you want to do. But I am telling you this, if you struggle with sin, you know where you need to go back to the root. You lost your fear of God. I'll show you in just a minute where Solomon started off in Proverbs 2 and Proverbs 3. I'll show you some passages through there, and I'll show you how he got away from about Proverbs 3 or 4 there until you get all the way out to Ecclesiastes and how he got away from the fundamental of fear in the Lord. And when he got away from that thing, his life was a shambles. The wisest man in all the earth. You say, what happened to him? He got dirty. He got dirty. Dirty dealings. Doing lascivious things. All right, look at this thing in Nehemiah chapter number 5. Now you know the story about Nehemiah and all the things that were going on there. Nehemiah was supposed to go and went before the king. He was the cupbearer and asked the king if he could go build the wall and this and that and the other. Verse number 15, the former governors had been before me, were chargeable unto the people, and had taken for them bread and wine, besides forty shekels of, sh shekels of cereal. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people. But so did, so did not I... Because Nehemiah said, they all took it. Everybody else did it. But Nehemiah said, I didn't do it. Not because I was worried about what it looked like to the people. I was afraid to do it because of God. I didn't take something that didn't belong to me. I kept myself above reproach. Nobody would question Nehemiah's just like everybody else. Just takes what he can take and get what he can get. Do you see that? You say, why? He was afraid of God. You don't want to keep you straight. Amen. I mean, we used to ask the question. I apologize for bringing up previous history, but we used to ask the question when they would come through and review boards. If you went into a pawn shop or a jewelry shop and the glass cases had been busted out and this and that and the other, and there's diamond necklaces and rings and stuff that are in there and no cameras around or anything, uh, how should we believe that you're not uh, going ahead and putting some of that stuff in your pocket and then just let it be charged to whatever criminal broke in and did it. Why should we trust you? Are you thinking now? You say, well, who's watching? What if nobody's watching? What would you do? Well, nobody will know. I mean, what's the big insurance will cover it? Watch it, Aiken. You better watch it, Aiken. You say, what happened? You know what was on trial when they went into the city of Jericho? Do you know what it was? That trial was on the character of the people. You say, what? Do you fear God enough to keep clean, to keep your paws off of what's not yours? Well, I'm entitled to it. Okay, Aiken. Go ahead and get your stuff and God's stuff mixed up. See how that works out for you. You don't realize it, but you don't recognize that God's watching the smallest of little things that are going on there. I don't care if it's a stinking paper clip. God's watching. Is that your paper clip? It's just a paper clip. Hey, man, they throw that many paper clips away. Is that your paper clip? I mean, what difference does it make? It's just a paper clip. They'll never even know it. They're just going to probably throw the thing out. I mean, they got a whole box of paper clips. What's wrong with a paper clip? And the Lord said, it ain't your paper clip. The fear of the Lord's clean. I want to be above reproach. Amen. I don't want somebody to question. That's what happened with Nehemiah. Did you just read it? Nehemiah said, everybody else is doing it. And even the people that are supposed to be serving, the people have the people under control. You know what he said about them? He said, they all took it. They all took the bread. They all took the wine. They all took 40 shekels of cereal. And Nehemiah said, I didn't do that. Why? Uh, because I was worried about getting my political office. I was worried about the king. I was worried about how to look to the people. He said, no, I didn't do it because I feared God. You ever read about Daniel? Daniel comes over in Daniel chapter number one and when they get ready to change his name and they get ready to change his diet, you know what Daniel said? I ain't doing it because God's watching. By the time you get to Daniel chapter number three, those three boys are standing there. They refuse to bow their head, or bend, uh, bend their knee and bow their head. And they come up there and they say, we're going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And he said, well, if God delivers us, he's God. And if he doesn't deliver us, he's still God. But we're not bowing down. You say, why? Because we fear God. You lost your fear of God. It's, it's kind of like this shifting things nowadays. It's like this situation ethics. I'm wore out with it. Amen. Well, under the circumstances and situation, all that, is it right? right. Well, I mean, you know, the way I got, is it right? Yeah. Come on. 
You wouldn't have all that chin music if you thought it was right. The chin music is because you know it ain't right. Take your Bible, if you will, please. You see, we are kind of driving that kind of hard. Yeah, but you don't realize, come to Romans chapter number 3, you don't realize how that is a slippery slope, boy. Yes, that thing will run you off, and the next thing you know, you know what you realize? You just failed the test, and guess who was the one that was giving you the test? It was the Lord. Yes, you kids, you go out, and mom and daddy finally trust you to, to go off with somebody, and you tell them you're going to go have pizza, and the next thing you know, you meet with some people mom and daddy told you not to meet with. But you know, you just happen to be at the same place where they're going to be and you know that they show up and you know what you ought to do. Don't tell me the Holy Spirit doesn't say you ought to pick up the phone and say, Daddy, I just want you to know we're here and, and can you come get me and all that kind of stuff. You know what you do? You cover it up. Right. You flunk the test. Yeah. The fear of the Lord's clean. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard this. People trying to explain their presence at the scene of a horrendous crime taking place that if they just hadn't been there, they wouldn't have to worry about an explanation. But it's like, well, I, I mean, I know I was there, but well, wh why were you there? You didn't have any business being there. Well, I know I was in the car, but I didn't know that's what they were going to do. Why were you there? If you're a Christian, you know what you should know? That ain't clean. That ain't clean. Scrolling through that stuff. I don't even know what it is now. Somebody bought something out and now all of a sudden it's a CIA op and it's been around and the secret squirrels have been uh, using it to track you and China's used it and this and that and the other Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat or something and now it's, uh, it, it's no longer the bird thing but it's an X. You ever study words that end in X? And now it's an X platform or something yep. by, the, by the smart guy, whatever his name is, dresses up like Iron Man or something or another. I'll think of his name in a minute. I'm not trying to trap you. I just don't. Uh, uh, um, Musk. Like Tusk or Husk or. But at any rate, n now it's X or, and whatever. And so now all of a sudden they're, they're literally arguing over banning that. And you think your preacher has been telling you for... But you're listening to the news media now. Your preacher's been telling you for years you should ban it. Now the news media is agreeing with your preacher. That stuff's bad. You shouldn't be using that stuff. They're using it to spy on you. Really? No kidding. They have phones out now and in the middle they have a crevice. I don't, I don't understand that. But when you're scrolling that stuff, is it clean stuff coming up? Come on, preacher. Well, preacher, it's a platform. I, that's not what I said. Right. Is it clean? Right. The fear of the Lord's clean. Yep. I made a covenant with my eyes. Right. I'll set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Amen. Come on, sister. You want your husband looking at the same feed you're looking at? Well, how come it don't upset you? It'd upset you if he was looking at it. Come on, sir. You want your wife seeing what you're looking at? Let her see the history of your feed. Oh, preacher, that stuff just pops up. Well, you've been searching for something and now all of a sudden they got a tag on you? Well, now, preacher, you know that's just how things are. Okay. The fear of the Lord's clean. Yep. Right. Right. No, thank you. Uh, preacher, that's just get a little old-fashioned. You lost your fear of God, hadn't you? Amen. You know what, some of you have gotten soft. Come on. Amen. You really have. You've gotten soft on being clean. Amen. And the fear of the Lord's clean, and it's holy, and it's perfect, and it's pure. And how come it is that that's not what's said about the modern church? Yeah. You've gotten soft on it. You've gotten accustomed to it. Not a big deal anymore. That's, 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 that's old-fashioned, goody-two-shoe stuff. That's Pharisaical stuff. It's interesting how everybody that's got one standard more than you got is a Pharisee. You've gotten loose. Letting it slip a little bit. You know, you're modern now. Chill out. Relax. Take it easy. You old dinosaur, we live in a different world now. 
The fear of the Lord is clean. Amen. So what you're doing clean? Why would you get mad at me for saying it's unclean if, it's, if the Lord doesn't tell you it's, oh, the Lord doesn't bother me about it? Well, then you might be out of fellowship. Why you hesitate there? I wish some of you parents that are trying to levy or lo lobby your kids to live a clean life, I wish you'd live as clean a life as what you're asking them to live. It's stuff that's okay for you to do that you don't want your kids doing. Romans chapter number 3. Fear of the Lord is clean. Fear of the Lord is clean. Look in verse number 11. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become pro uh, unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. See, you thought it's just me. <laughs> an open sepulcher. That means every time they talk, their breath stinks. They sound like they're talking from out of a septic tank. Just foul talk and bless you. It's not always filthy talk in the sense of cursing and swearing. It's just always at somebody else's expense running somebody down somewhere. I don't know how you have the time to be so enamored. The inquirer has nothing on the, the typical Baptist church. Amen. Newspapers and these things that they hang out there at the, and you go by the, the, uh, the, the, the shopping, the grocery store thing. You, you know what I'm trying to say. You got to help me a little bit here. And that kind of, they don't have anything that's typical nowadays. I mean, it's literally, it's on your phone. Const I don't know how, to, how do you have time to do that? Where do you find time for all of that? Doesn't that cause anxiety for you? That you're so balled up in what everybody else is doing? How do you have a life that way? It's like as the stomach pumps and the world burns. I mean, it's like, man, it is a constant, this soap opera life. Is life not busy enough and hard enough than for you to be worrying about what everybody else is doing? The fear of the Lord is clean. Did I say that? Before long, you don't realize it, but you've become somebody else's garbage collector. And you're carrying their trash around. I don't know about you. I, I'm kind of funny about that. When we put out that big old green can, I mean, it's got all kind of stuff in there, man. Our garbage is so bad, we actually line the garbage can. Because why? Because otherwise you've got to wash it out all the time. This way I can just take up a bag. I learned that from somebody. And I can throw the bag away and put a fresh bag in there. And it keeps the can. Kind of, but you know what's a strange thing? I have yet to stop at other people's trash and dig through their garbage. You know, it's kind of like, I don't, I don't want your maggots. I got enough of my own. You know, something's rotted and all of a sudden you got these little tiny little looking little bead things on there and you're thinking, oh, what is that? Oh, somebody put some seeds out here. It must be some birds or something. <laughs> and before long, them little seeds are starting to wave at you. And you're like, maggots? I'm not that filthy. How's that? I don't need any more maggots. Do you understand where I'm going? If the fear of the Lord is clean, why are we someone else's garbage collector and purveyor? taking their garbage and spreading it out all over the place. Amen. The fear of the Lord's clean. It's a strange thing to me about the Lord. I've come to him with pretty much everything I can think of, literally. I've talked to him about things I would never even discuss with you. You know, it's an interesting thing that when I get finished talking to him, I feel clean. Amen. And when I get finished talking to him, I know for a fact he's not going to go take my trash and dump it on somebody else. He doesn't carry my garbage and say, hey, you know what? I mean, if anything, he's a recycler. He's not a garbage collector. <laughs> he's like, I think I can make something out of that trash and we can dig it and dung it a little bit longer and maybe, uh, maybe we can get some fruit out of it after a while. But you know what's strange? He never brings my garbage and dumps it on somebody else. Amen. The fear of the Lord's clean. Are you clean? The antithesis would be if you're clean, then you must fear the Lord. And if you're not clean, well, you can fill in the blank, can't you? All right, keep going. Their throats an open sepulcher, their tongues they have used deceit, the poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their way. The way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their... You think I'm just... Making stuff up? <laughs> there it is. 
The reason for all that behavior is there's no fear of God. Those are individuals that are talking about unsaved individuals. You shouldn't even find yourself in that category. Come to Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians 5. Then we'll go back over to Proverbs. Well, preacher, anybody can run these verses. Okay, well, why don't you run them? Because you don't like what they have to say. I'm sure it's still taught. I know for a fact it's a precedent that's set. I'd have to maybe ask Miss Elaine about it for sure. But uh, you can't use in a court of law the uh, ignorance of the law. Ignorance of the law is still considered to be no excuse. Just because you didn't know it, you broke the law. It's like, well, I didn't know. Well, that's what you think about the Bible sometimes. Well, I didn't know it. I didn't read it. I didn't understand it. And therefore, I'm not accountable to it. No, you had the opportunity to read it, know it, and understand it. Just because you didn't read it, that's on you. But it's still there and you're still accountable to it. Imagine walking up there in heaven one day and all of a sudden you run into Malachi. And you say, hey, how are you doing? And he says, I'm doing pretty well. How are you? And I'm doing pretty well. What's your name? My name is Malachi. Oh, really? Malachi. Seems like I've heard that name somewhere before. Are you famous or something? No, I wouldn't know I'm famous, but uh, I did write a book in the Bible. You wrote a book in the Bible? Yeah, I wrote the book of Malachi. <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah, you didn't know that? You didn't read it? I know you read Jonah because you like to read about the story of the whale, you know, and about the rebellion and about Nineveh and all that kind of stuff. You ever think about that? What about Malachi? What about Nehemiah? What about Ezra? Here's a good one for you. What about Amos? He's just a farm boy. You ever read it? Amos has got some of the most unbelievable prophetic stuff you've ever read in your life. You know what he says about the last day? There's a famine in the land of hearers of the word of God. That's what Amos says. Imagine running into Amos. That's God's prophet. You say, well, he didn't call down fire and he didn't do all the other things, Elijah and Moses. I know you like those guys, Moses and Elijah and that kind of thing. I like them too. Elisha doing twice as many miracles. Who's Amos? He's just a farm boy, but he wrote a book in the Bible. God used him. He was God's pen on paper. It's a pretty good thing. You imagine you get up there to heaven and the Lord say, did you, did you read it? I used the illustration before, but it bears repeating. Uh, my wife, years ago, she used to write me letters and stuff. I mean, we were madly in love. We wrote letters on the stinking mirror and all kind of crazy stuff and stuff like that along the way. You start thinking about all this stuff and you come start winding things down, thinking about, you know, what in the cat here got me where I'm at kind of a thing. And I'm thinking about all that. Imagine if she put a card. She would do that almost every trip, put a card in there. Or she'd take a piece of paper and write stuff on that thing and fold it up. Imagine if I'd took that thing out, saw a card that was there and says on there, P, and I just throw it over in the corner and she said, hey, did you get my letter? Yeah, I got it. Did you read it? Well, no, honey, I've I'm, I'm been really busy. Can you imagine how that would hurt her to know that she took the time to put her heart on paper? Yep. Amen. Amen. Say, why, I just wanted you to know I love you and praying for you. I got a couple of them pinned or, or, or taped into my Bible. You, you say, well, that's just, that's just stupid. I don't know. She's stuck on me 44 years. You call it stupid and you like it or don't like it. It don't matter. To put up with anybody for 44 years deserves a Congressional Medal of Honor, man. <laughs> but imagine if I take that thing out. Did you read it? No. I wrote you a love letter. Did you read it? You know, there's a lot of things that she wrote me in cards that I wouldn't read in public. They were written to me in private. They're not filthy. Get your mind out of the gutter, but they're personal. You know, there's a lot of things in this right here. They're not public. They're personal. I don't want to get up there to heaven. So, well, preacher, I read and I don't get anything out of it. Yeah, but I'll be jumped if I'm going to get up there and whether I got something out of it or not. And him say, did you read it? And I'll go, uh, well, I, you know, yes, sir, I read it. 
Did you understand it? Well, um, no, sir. I'm sorry to say I didn't. <laughs> well, we know you're an idiot, but glad you at least tried. <laughs> Made an effort. Amen. Do you read it? When he says, give attention to reading, do you fear him enough to do what he says? How many of you in here have been to school, public or otherwise? How many of you were given a reading assignment that you didn't want to do, but if you didn't do it, you'd flunk the class? How many of you did the reading assignment? Well, you scallywag, you. <laughs> you do it for carnal things, you won't do it for spiritual? The fear of the Lord's clean. You know, it'd be an amazing thing if you took the time to realize how short you fall. You'd be so surprised how quick you'd get your eyes off everybody else's paper. Amen. If you just said, you know what he said for me to give attendance to reading. And what he said, study to show myself approved unto God, a workman needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's a lot of division in there. A lot of things I need to do. If I get busy about doing that, you know what I do? I keep my nose on my own paper. Amen. It's funny what we'll do when we have something to gain out of it. Look in Galatians chapter number 5. Let's move along here just a little bit. The fear of the Lord's clean. I want to stay clean. I, I want to be able to have the power. Can I say this to you? If you're used to being around dirty things, you get accustomed to dirty things. Any of you has ever raised pigs? Anybody? Miss Barbara's raised pigs before? Uh, okay. Brother Dale, you raised pigs? Okay. Brother Donnie's raised pigs before? Not many of you. You know an interesting thing about a, a, about a pig farmer? You go around pigs after a while, you get away from that. You only have to be around them for about an hour. You come back out. There'll be a certain smell about you that anybody that's ever been around pigs, they're going to know you've been around pigs. I'm not talking about bacon <laughs> and ham. I'm talking about oink oink pigs in the pen. You know, there's a certain smell. You know what happens if you're a pig farmer? You can walk in after working out there with the pigs all day long and walk into a group of people and you don't even know you don't smell like everybody else. You get desensitized to the smell. Have you, know, have you ever been into the morgue before? There's a smell there. It's more than just formaldehyde. You walk around there and you know what happens? After a while, when you walk out of there, you can sit down there at 17th and Main, get ready to have a half a chicken on a half a loaf of bread with some curly fries and stuff that Miss Lucille pours out there on the table. And you sit down there, man, and get ready to eat. And people are looking at you like, man, where have you been? You smell like death. But I've seen them over there open up the cooler and take out a peanut butter sandwich and a glass of milk. And sit there and eat it right there. All them dead people stretched out up and down on either side. They got accustomed to it. The fear of the Lord's clean. You got accustomed to your filth. Yes. It's no longer dirty anymore. Doesn't stink anymore, does it? All you got to do is listen to how you talk. I can, I can tell you, if you listen to how you talk, you'll realize, you know something? I smell like a pig. I talk like a pig. All you have to do is just listen. When you go to the doctor, they don't do it as much anymore. When you go to the doctor, unless it's a specialist, you know one of the first things that they do? They say to you, open up your mouth and say, ah. Oh. Stick out your tongue. They can tell a whole lot of things by looking at your tonsils and your adenoids and the shape and the contours of your mouth and that kind of a deal. But they can tell a lot by looking at your tongue. It's not just to see further down into your esophagus and trachea and all that other stuff. It's that your tongue is out there. You know what you can tell? You can tell a lot about your spiritual condition and how clean you are if you just stick out your tongue. That's good. Go see Dr. Jesus. You know, he say, stick out your tongue. You feeling dirty? Well, maybe you need a shower. That the fear of the Lord's clean, you know what I want to do? <laughs> Give me a blood bath, man. Amen. Clean me up. Thank you for pointing it out. Yes, you have a real friend. You know what a real friend will do? They'll walk up to you and say, hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, you've been wearing that suit and hadn't been to the cleaners in a while. You could stand it up in a corner <laughs> over there. <laughs> you know, now you, should, you wouldn't get offended by that, would you? 
You got sweat stains underneath the, the, the suit you're wearing. And the friend of yours comes and says, hey man, you, you, you're, you're dirty. We you mean I'm dirty? You, you stink. Thank you for telling me. Put on a little foo-foo juice or something to cover it up. That ain't going to last long. You can only cover it up so long. Good preaching, preacher. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, what's the best thing to do? Go home, take a shower, and change clothes. Yes, yes. Put off the old man. Amen. Put on the new man. Yes, but don't put on the new man over the old man. Yes, you don't put in new wine in the old wine skin. It's going to bust the bag. Preacher, you, you got to be kidding. No, it's all right in the passages. The fear of the Lord's clean. Are you clean? It's indicative of the fact. You want to know the root cause? I'm not talking about symptoms. I'm not thinking about things that can present themselves and it could be any number of things. I'm telling you what the root of the problem is. You don't fear the Lord. That's why you're dirty. If this nation feared God, Nineveh would have nothing on you. Man, Jonah's preaching got to the heart of the matter. That man's got his animals fasting and wearing sackcloth and ashes. Man, you get a king's attention like that for his animals to put on sackcloth? Can you imagine your little old dog come out of there? Come here. <laughs> a little old mutt comes up there and you put on burlap and say, you're not eating dinner tonight. You go out and get your mules and your horses and you put on burlap. Lord, I'm letting you know I mean business. Boy, I'm telling you what, if we feared the Lord, you know why they did that? You say, man, Jonah was a great preacher. No, they were afraid of the Lord. Yes. You know what happens in the tribulation period? Those uh, ghoulie monsters come out of the pit there in Revelation chapter number 9. And uh, people are crying for the stones to fall on them and hide us from the face of the wrath of the Lamb and so on and so forth like that. And the Bible says, and neither did they repent of their and list their sins in spite of everything going on. They're not afraid of the one that's coming to get them. Well, how about you? Preacher, you're telling me I ought to fear the Lord? Yeah. Yeah, I sure am. I'm telling you, that's the reason for a dirty life. I'm telling you, that's the reason for a dirty mind. And I'm telling you, more importantly, that's the reason for a dirty heart. Amen. The fear of the Lord's clean. Yes, We're too close to the edge nowadays, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know about you. I've been around hospitals here lately, and I'm sure it affects me in all kind of ways, and it definitely affects what your, where your mind is. I'm aware of that. I'm, I'm not completely ignorant. But it's an interesting thing. They get ready to go into the OR the other day, and the guy comes out of the scrub thing there, and I can see him through the little pane in the window, and he comes out, and he's got this, and there comes the, the, the head nurse back there, and they got everybody in the world back there to oversee all the procedure and stuff. And it's an interesting thing. Nobody could touch that guy that was doing the stuff unless they'd already been scrubbed up and cleaned up and then they get him where he becomes that way. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? That's being in the right crowd. You say, why? All it takes to interrupt, as I understand it, the purity of the surgical field is one person to violate those rules and they have to start all over again of that whole procedure. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. Some of you people in here that are doctors and nurses and that kind of thing, you can tell me, but that's what they tell me. You interrupt that surgical field. They take that stuff out of that stuff and peel it out. They lay it all out there on the little blue thing on the table. You stick your paw over there. If you haven't been scrubbed and washed and all that, all them instruments and everything are no good. No, the gauze, no good. The stutures and everything, no good. It's all done. You got to start all over again. You say, why? You interrupted the pure clean the, the, the field. You've gotten accustomed to being dirty, Christian. It's no big deal anymore. I'm thinking if I'm going to get off, I don't care if it's a dentist putting his hands in my mouth. Right. Where are them hands been? Mm -hmm. yes. You better have scrubbed up. Yeah. But isn't it funny how we don't spiritually consider being around people that aren't surgically clean? And how it interrupts that surgical field. And before long, it's like, well, I got a little infection. Where'd that come from? I don't know. They were operating on me. Somebody's hands were dirty. Somebody's fingernails were dirty. 
I, I can tell you, I don't mind having dirty fingernails. I don't want a guy sticking his hands in my mouth with dirty fingernails. You've got these guys over here working and doing all that kind of stuff. I, I, they're going to get dirty. I get all that. But you ain't going to operate on me that way. Now, Christian, you got to be thinking about it. Why are you gotten accustomed to the filth? I'm just asking you, if the fear of the Lord's clean, are you clean? I'm clean, preacher. Well, praise the Lord. Good. Pray for the rest of us. Galatians chapter number 5. About out of time. The Bible says this uh, in the, uh, the, the works of the flesh. Look at this in verse 19. Let's just see if it, maybe you're around, maybe you're not. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance. Emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Envyings, murders, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. You say, what is that? That's a Christian that chooses to walk in the flesh. You say, what happens? He winds up getting dirty. Look real quick in Proverbs. Can you give me just a minute here? Let me show you something in Proverbs. Come to Proverbs chapter, uh, let's pick it up in two first. This thing's really helped me because you realize sometimes people talk about, well, you know, preacher, I'm from the South, you know. Well, you know, preacher, how it is, you know, you do, we just get backslid on God sometimes, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, I've thought about that. And then, you know what it begins to be? It begins to be this idea, well, everybody backslides. Okay, but wait a minute. Do we have to backslide? I mean, I've known some saints. I mean, I, I, I feel like I've known a few that, that maybe they're not in the perfect fellowship all the time, but I wouldn't really say they're backsliding. Well, you know how it is, preacher, you get backslid on God sometimes, you know, that kind of like, like, well, you get dirty every now and then, it's just the way it is. Well, no, well, wait a minute. If I have this principle down pat that I'm fixing to show you about the fear of the Lord, you know what it'll do? It'll reduce the amount of times I do backslide. It'll keep me clean. Don't tell me if you didn't think you were going to get caught, you would go ahead and do what you did. The only reason you did what you did was because you didn't think you was going to get caught. Here's Solomon when he gets ready to start out. Look in Proverbs chapter number 2. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice of understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest her as a hid from treasures, thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. If you do those things, you'll understand the fear of the Lord. Look in Proverbs chapter 3. That's where Solomon started off. Come all the way down to verse number 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and do what? Well, you know what happens. Solomon gets away from that. I'll close with this. We'll pick it up on Wednesday night. But let me say this. You know what happens? Solomon gets away from that. Take your Bible to come over to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We'll close it here. Ecclesiastes 12. Go to the last two verses there. Solomon the preacher, in this case he's called. Solomon the wisest of all men that have ever walked on two feet, exception of Jesus Christ himself, the wisest man in all the earth. Solomon started off right, but you know what happened? He started playing Russian roulette with the Lord and took the grace of God and turned it into lasciviousness and started making some decisions. So much so, if you study the life of Solomon, you'll see sometimes he's a type of Christ and sometimes he's one of the most perfect types of the Antichrist you've ever seen in your life. He's got every attribute of the Antichrist. And yet he's David's offspring. And he's given the sure mercies of David. How can a man that's that wise wind up? I get asked that question a lot of times. Well, preacher, if he's so wise, why did he have a thousand wives and concubines? How can you say you're wise and have that? I don't know. The Bible says he's the wisest man on all the earth. Why is that the first thing that you look at? But the bottom line says, why you say, what happened? I can tell you how he got in that mess. He forgot his roots. When I got saved, ladies and gentlemen, this is my own personal testimony. I won't give you the whole thing. I'll bear out the time. But when I got saved, I'm telling you right now, I got saved because I was afraid I was going to burn forever. I was afraid of what God would do to me. Preacher, I just don't think that's a good reason. That's just not a very loving father. Well, you get saved however you want to get saved. I got saved pure and simple because I didn't want to burn. And I believed I was going to burn. At seven years of age, I'm thinking, I'm roasted, man. 
I'm, my goose is cooked. I'm, I mean, I'm sitting there. I can't wait to get saved. I'm scared. I'm thinking I'm going to burn before dinner's over with. And you say, what is that, preacher? That's the fear of the Lord. Solomon comes to the end of his life. Do you see that in the last couple of verses there? You know what he says? There's a time coming where I'm paraphrasing here where the Lord's going to bring every secret thing in the judgment. Every secret thought. Do you see that? I mean, not just what you did, what you thought. Does that not rattle your cage? Whew, thank God for the blood, man. I'm like, hey, man, I know a good deal when I get in on it. I don't want my thoughts coming out. Preacher, you shouldn't be thinking those things. You shouldn't be thinking what you just thought. <laughs> but then you know what he does? He comes out at the end of that passage there. You know what he says? This is the whole duty of man. What? Fear God and keep the commandments. Solomon just ended up his life and said, let me tell you where the wisest man in all the earth messed up. I lost my fear of God. I forgot who God was and what started me down this path. You struggle with sin? Preacher, sure everybody struggles with sin. I'm not talking about everybody. I'm talking about you. You struggle with sin? You say, yeah, preacher, can you help me eradicate it? Do you really want to get better? I'm not going to give you sequester yourself and tie yourself in a room or go sit up on top of a pole somewhere or keep yourself from this and that and the other. I can tell you what will keep you out of trouble. I can tell you when you're by yourself what will keep you out of trouble when nothing else will. It's the fear of the Lord. Amen. It's knowing God's watching. That old woman that used to walk around that house saying, watching you, watching you. Man, I had no idea what she was singing. God's watching you when you're in private. God's watching you when you're by yourself. God's watching you when nobody else is watching you. God's watching you. That's where you get into trouble. Well, nobody else knows, preacher. It won't make a difference. He knows. He knows. That's why you don't put the jewelry in your pocket. That's why you don't speed just because everybody else is speeding. God's watching. God's watching. God's watching.